Let's do it to it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Tonight we are on episode 189, and we thought it would be a good night to chat a little bit about car camping. And this was actually one of yours that came up, Ben, so you, uh, why don't you lead us into it and how we came about it and all that good stuff, and then we'll, I know I have a few things I want to cover, and I'm sure you have a few things to cover. Well, hopefully yes. we'll make this work organically. <laughs> so, like a lot of my ideas, I, I actually spend a bit of time on, like, forms and stuff and just see what the questions people are asking and stuff and somebody brought up something where they asked about car camping and, and how can you do it without a lot of expensive equipment and stuff and and there's a lot to unpack on that question that seems like a simple question but it's it's not really and so i think in this particular instance they were going from somewhere in the states up up north and they were going to be in, in some cold weather so they would have to deal with some pretty pretty rough weather and, and how can you do it without having to pick up all kinds of specialty equipment. Now, not knowing what you're starting with, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, so we're going to have to break it down into a few things, but that was the gist of it. If you wanted to spend, say, an extended period of time camping with your car, what do you need? Is it the same stuff that you would do if you were just do, doing backwards camping? What are the advantages and disadvantages? And these are some of the things I think we'll, uh, we'll definitely get into and uh, cover for this, right? So Yeah, and that's kind of along the same lines of what I thought when you brought it to me, too. Um, I I might have looked at a few more short-term things, too, because uh, when I thought it, I said, oh, yeah, there's some neat stuff you can do while you're car camping. So I have some examples of that and some thoughts on some of that, but I'm sure I can squeeze it in organically here somewhere. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean, instantly... I mean, what a lot of people go to is why would you want to? So there, there's definitely a few reasons. I mean, obviously, it's distance and time, right? Um, your automobile just can get you further quicker, right? I mean, that's the gist of it. So if you don't have a lot of time or even those of us that aren't, that isn't the intent, we still oftentimes do a bit of car camping to get to the site. So if mm -hmm. you end up... If you want to go camping somewhere that's not close to home, sometimes it's best to drive, maybe stay at the car for the night, and then start your, your hike in for an overnighter. So you can start refreshed and have a full day to get in. So uh, I think even the most uh, true to the backwoods camping may sometimes have to use this method. It's, it's not, not unheard of. And so, it's not a bad method either. Like the reality is for a lot of people, this is how they get out. You know what I mean? Like they may only have the ability to get out and crash in their cars and that's their camping, which is perfectly fine too. Uh, and then there's the, uh, there's the other side of this. If you go to the extreme end, there's some people that actually live in their vehicles either by choice or otherwise. And they may even have, if anybody's listening, perhaps they'll pick up a few things too, or maybe we'll learn a few things. Well, in fact, some of my ideas do come from watching these people because there is a whole um, group of people. There's a, there's a, a whole YouTube thing on people who are living out of their cars because they're, it makes sense to them. And I, I can already hear people that don't understand that have never looked into it saying, well, you know, who would do that or why would you do that? But some of those people look at it and say, why are you paying $3,000 a month for rent in a place that you only spend a couple hours in because you work? eight, 12 hours a day and you spend the evenings out with your buddies. So you only need a place to sleep. So, you know, and I mean, that's, that's the thing. The, the reality is there's reasons for it. Uh, and those can be debatable in any way, shape or form, but for the scope of us, it doesn't matter. No. <laughs> but so, you know, and it's generally, it's a car is something that most people would have or, or would need if they're, they're covering any emerging amount of distance. Um, so you could bus some places, but you don't have the freedom and Uber costs a lot after a period of time. So you're, you, you know, you have your limits, right? So somebody could say, what's the best vehicle? Let's just start off. What is the absolute best vehicle to do it? And I'm going to use the old adage. It's the vehicle you have, because if you don't have it, it's not. um, I agree. And I would almost add to that. It would depend on what you're going to do with it and where you're going with it. You know, Yes, a hundred percent. And, and that has so many factors. We could spend a whole episode on that actually. Um, but to try and keep it somewhat limited and I, and I, I know you have, is bigger vehicles going to burn more gas. Small vehicles are going to be more cramped and have less cargo space. Um, and some vehicles are much more 
visible than other vehicles. So if you're planning on camping in, say, more rural uh, and urban areas where there are people, uh, you may want something that's a little more inconspicuous. And if you're planning camping in some pretty rough and rugged roads, then maybe you need something with slightly bigger tires and maybe, you know, four wheel drive. And, you know, those are options. Uh, and yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that's kind of what I was thinking. Like, yeah. you're not going to take your car into rock crawling country and, you know, <laughs> you're probably not going to take your massive truck, maybe you would, I don't know, into an urban area if you were going to do some sort of urban camping. Uh, shout out to Duncan Dixon joining us back. It has been a while, Duncan. Thanks for joining us again, sir. Um, but we do, like, we know that there are the, you know, the pavement princesses. There are Jeep Wrangler Unlimiteds that have never seen dirt roads. And we also know that there are people out there in Toyota Priuses have gone up roads that really they should not have. <laughs> <laughs> Funny enough, I had a buddy and yeah. literally didn't matter what he drove. He would put it anywhere. You know what yeah. I mean? His motorcycle went in places that I would not take my four wheeler. And that's just how he was. His vehicles got him where he had to go. Didn't matter what it was or where it was. Yeah. And, and it's not uncommon. It's not unusual. Um, I grew up in backwoods Newfoundland and I seen, you know, uh, Chevy Cavaliers, where there should not be Chevy Cavaliers, guys would shudder the thought of bringing their trucks and SUVs back there. But they're like, yeah, that's where the moose was, and I'm going to get it. So they drove, right? <laughs> uh, I've been in backwoods Cape Breton and found vehicles. And I'm like, how did he make that tow pad? How did he get there? Because I stopped a long time ago with my truck thinking this is not right. <laughs> so super quick story, because I want to keep rolling with the topic, but it is relevant. You know the mm -hmm. waterfalls where we first went camping? Yep. Well, when I met the gentleman that showed me how to get into that place, he went into there, and I think it was a Honda Civic, all the way back to that first landing where you and I were. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? <laughs> for anybody yeah. that hasn't seen the road, it's, it's quite complicated for a Honda Civic. Let's put it that way. Right. Not that it can't be done, and, and, and we aren't judging. Me, <laughs> me and Robert will not judge where you bring your vehicle. We just won't follow necessarily with ours. Uh necessarily it depends on the day and mood yeah very true but i think honestly for the big pros and cons you summed it up really good at the first of it the bigger the vehicle the more it's going to drink gas and potentially limit where it's going to go just by its simple size but you have extra carry capacity potentially over terrain capacity and just more room in general for whatever you're going to be doing there because i know a lot of people think of like camper vans you know what I mean? Yeah. Not specifically made camper vans, because that's kind of getting off the topic, but like a van that somebody has turned into a camper. And uh, a friend of ours had done something like that with uh, their truck, put a hatch on it, and they made themselves literally an overlanding camper. You yeah. know what I mean? So. And, and so a truck with a cat works very well. A minivan, take the seats out, and you have more than enough room to lay out uh, a good size air mattress. You can build a wooden bed, have a foam thing in it. I've seen people do it with small hatchbacks and even sedans where you, you've kind of removed the back seat, put a flat piece of plywood in, prop it up so it sits more or less level when the vehicle's level and you have enough room. Maybe your feet are inside the trunk but and your head is up against the driver's seat, but you're, you're in and you're comfortable-ish. Um, and you can build storage compartments and stuff like you can do it in a pretty small vehicle. Um, I can do it in both of my vehicles. I think I've seen you do it in your vehicle. Not this current Ranger. I, I have slept in it, but not as well as my last Ranger when I had the cap. I had a full-on setup for the old Ranger with the cap. I've done it in Melissa's car, for sure. You've That's seen that one. Thinking, right? And, that, and Melissa's car was smaller than my SUV. And I slept and, quite comfortably for what it was. Right? So things to keep in mind, though, oftentimes, like, small SUVs and stuff, when the seats lay down flat, flat is not necessarily flat. So <laughs> yeah. Oftentimes there's a hump or there's a dip or there's something that, that doesn't make it as ideal as possible. So just keeping that in mind. And, and there's things you can do to level that out. Just know that it may not be perfect. 
Uh, that doesn't mean you can't do it. No, and much like most of what we say here, consider it another piece of gear. Before you ever leave on your adventure, try to work out the kinks and stuff like that before you leave the driveway. So put your seats down, throw your air mattress in there if you are going to use an air mattress or your bed roll or whatever it happens to be, and try it. You don't necessarily have to sleep the night, but just lay there and read a book for an hour, and trust me, you're going to find anything uncomfortable about that. Yeah. So... Try. Even if you can't do that, I've seen people do it with um, the front seat. You can recline your front seats and sleep on those. Not, in my opinion, a recommended solution. Uh, I would rather try to sleep across the back seat than in a front seat recline. Sleeping across, you're still kind of in the fetal position, and uh, it won't be super comfortable. But it does allow you to do it without necessarily having to take an extra mattress, an extra piece of gear, right? No, 100%. And sleeping in the back of your car, that's actually not that uncomfortable, especially if, you, like, you can get an air mattress that fits in the back of your car. You know what yeah. I mean? I think I have one here. Yeah. So this is literally, and it's fairly inexpensive. To me, this would not be, you know, a high-ticket item, so to speak, under 100 bucks. It's pretty good in my book for some of the stuff I've bought. Seeing I bought yeah. stuff that's well in excess of $100 as well. You know, um, paid more for less. <laughs> yep. And, I mean, this literally just inflates, drops into the back of most cars, and that's going to give you a fairly decent place to sleep. The disadvantage to something like this is, like yourself, Ben, where you're a little taller. Unless you sleep with your legs pulled up a little bit, you're probably banging up against both doors. But I can guarantee you it's still more comfortable than trying to sleep in a reclined driver's seat. I've yes. never had a good night's sleep in one of those. I have done it, but I've, you're right. It's not. It's not a great night. It, you know, for one night to get you from point A to point B, does it work? A hundred percent. Is it ideal? Definitely not. But it is what it is, right? We we deal with what we have to. Um. So, what does it give you? It gives you generally, depending on the vehicle. I've had exceptions. Uh, a rain weatherproof structure. Right. It usually gives you more than enough room to carry some basic supplies. So you have usually enough room for sleeping bags, changes of clothes, food. Um, you know, even some of the smaller cars out there, usually you can carry like, a, you know, a good size backpack and extra stuff. So more than you would carry into the woods normally. Um, so, so those are some really good advantages. You can ch charge most of your gear because most cars have at least a 12 volt supply, if not a built in inverter. And I was going to say, yeah. even if it doesn't have a built-in inverter, uh, low wattage inverters, I think like 300 watts, they're fairly inexpensive. I think I've seen 90 watt ones at Crappy Tire for literally fourteen ninety nine. just plugs directly oh, yeah. into the 12 volt. And just to set the record straight, Troy, I didn't do anything. I was out camping. Uh, it rained. You probably missed this one. I had a, a hammock set up. It rained. Uh, it ran in my cord for the underquilt, and it pooled <laughs> under me. Uh, and anybody that knows this story, that's when I decided I thought the lake was flooding. <laughs> and I fell out of the hammock and all this good stuff. And long story short, instead of trying to dry it all out and set it up in the middle of the night, I just crawled into the car and went to sleep. Don't worry, Troy. It wasn't that he was he got in trouble with the wife. It's worse. He lost all woodsman skills and ended up drowning inside a hammock. Yep. Yep, it's uh, above water level. <laughs> it's great, but I mean that's that's the truth. Sometimes this is the good thing about car camping as well. I knew that it was easy to fold down the seats and jump in back. Much like Ben said, though, sometimes flat's not flat. I probably would have fine tuned it a little bit more had I known that was going to be my bed for the night. But it did work. I had a little air mattress, blew it up, threw it in, worked great. And you reported a decent, nice sleep after that. So, I mean, I can't even knock it. So, you, you did good. Um, yeah. If you're going in colder weather, this is, and we've, we have covered some of these topics in the past. If you're going in colder weather, I still highly recommend a decent sleeping bag. Um, although you could and can, and I see no issue, run the car for short periods of time to, to produce heat, a car will not retain that heat for long periods of time without no. some pouring a little bit more in and we've talked about this before you could light a candle or a small lantern inside and that'll keep a lot of the chill out uh but be careful with that if you knock it over you could have wax over everything you could create a bigger fire it, it would be an issue so make sure if you do anything like that it's secure it's not going to to cause a problem um no funny very, oh, sorry 
Go ahead. Uh, be very careful with anything electrical. You say, oh, I can get a 12 volt heater, heater and just plug it in. And that sounds awesome. Um, and it'll run for about 15, 20 minutes with the car off before the, the battery yeah. taps out. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned about how they don't hold their heat well. That's really true. Like us here in Canada, the second you're out in really cold weather and you shut the car off, it's you might keep it warm, quote unquote, and by warm, not as cold as outside, five, six minutes if you're lucky. But what I have seen a lot of folks do when they turn their vans into campers and stuff like that, or they're going to stay in their vans, is they actually insulate the walls and floor a little bit. Retains a little bit of that heat. It's fairly inexpensive. They usually just use felt or, you know, whatever they could really find to stick on the walls. And I mean, yeah. it sounds pretty low tech, but for the purposes of what you've seen on the form there, like they didn't want to get into big money. If they had that option to them, even in a car, if you're not really like, if it's not your daily driver or you just don't mind the old shag carpet look from, you know, previous eras. Uh, if you put some insulation in there, that's really going to greatly enhance the heat retention. So one of the things people do is buy record reflectix, cut out to the exact shape of their windows and pop them in and they, they can fold up or roll up pretty easy. You can put it out of the way when you're not using it, but when you pull in for the night, you pop that in, they kind of snap in place. And the beauty of that is not only does it keep heat in, but it also keeps eyes out. And if you do have light in, it keeps the light inside. So people don't see that you're lit up. So if you're watching a show on your TV, it's not like this, this light glow, someone drive by, it's oh, there's somebody in there, right? And they pick at you. So it sort of makes you a little bit less noticeable. Um, and it works. Funny enough, I had something similar here too. Not quite as fancy as that. These were just curtains. And this was yeah. one of the things that I was like, well, if you are going to stay in your car or your vehicle or whatever, a little bit of privacy goes a long way to make you feel more secure about yourself. Uh, realistically, how much security is adding? Probably none, but it, the whole mental game, you know what I mean? Which is a big part of being out there and camping anyway. This gives you a little bit of privacy. Uh, if you had to get changed or something and you're in a campground or just wherever you happen to be, it's not that private. You now have that availability. It's real simple things. And this is like 17 bucks. Yeah. Not yeah. high cost at all. And Reflexix is not all that expensive. I think if you go to the hardware store, go over by the, the hot water heaters, and you're going to oftentimes find a kit for a hot water heater that would be more than big enough to cover all your windows. Um, or at least ballparkish. And I think those cost, last I checked, were about 20 to 30 bucks. Uh, and you can buy rolls of Reflexix just for insulation, not cut for that stuff for slightly more. So I mean, options are out there. Um, so that's, that's a good method. So keeping that little bit of heat in and retaining it, it is important. Things to watch out for. And I say this, if you're in deeper snow, if you're in a big snowstorm and things could sort of block your exhaust and allow that, that exhaust to sort of get trapped under the vehicle or into the vehicle, that could be a problem. So do be aware that carbon monoxide is a possibility. Funny if enough, Troy said the same thing. Uh, the good side of that is you can get carbon monoxide detectors. They're fairly inexpensive and you can put them in your vehicle if it is a worry and you're going to be in that situation. You definitely can. It, but if there's nothing around your vehicle, it's not that bad. I've done it a bunch of times. I've never had an issue. Generally, if you've got an, a breeze outside, it's more than enough to keep the exhaust away from the car and it just doesn't get trapped in the car. Liability disclaimer, to... mileage may vary. <laughs> Try at yeah. your own risk. If your exhaust is leaking or if you, you know, it's overly loud. So if you have a Civic, don't do it. <laughs> right? It's, you have a Civic. There's no point in, no, <laughs> no. But if, if there, if there is damage to your exhaust or stuff like that, do, do be aware that that is a possibility um, and be aware of, of the risks, right? Generally, yeah. when I've done it, I've ran the vehicle for 10, 15 minutes until I can get enough heat in the vehicle that I'm, I'm no longer shivering. And then I usually shut it off and I was good for probably another 15, 20 minutes. So it was an on and off thing. And there are remote starters you can get that would automatically do that. Um, believe it or not, you, you hold the button a certain way and, and it will just keep the vehicle warm overnight. It's, it's, it's designed for places where you can't plug your car in and it could get cold enough to kill your car. So there are options for that. that they'll automatically do it. You, know, you probably wake you every hump it starts, but... Well, I know my Ford, through my phone app, I can actually schedule starts, tell it to start every so many minutes and run for so long. So that's becoming more and more of an option. Uh, and yeah, definitely older cars are definitely going to have more 
problems with carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, Troy. Anybody that's going to try that, like I said, use at your own risk. Of course, carbon monoxide detector is going to be your gold standard there. The other thing with running your car is you are consuming fuel. So budgetary wise and with the cost of gas right now, as everybody knows, um, it may not be the most efficient way of heating your car if you don't have any of that extra insulation. You may want to look into other ways of doing it. As Ben said, uh, there is 12 volt heaters. They come with their own complications. But what I have seen other people do was take bunk heaters from uh, tractor trailers. And I'm not saying this is a cheap option. I'm just saying it's an option I've seen. Uh, they've gone and gotten bunk heaters from transfer trucks, you know, just went to a scrapyard that, you know, these places go when they're road off or whatever, bought the bunk heater and basically had somebody pipe it into their current situation. And then it runs off diesel. You have to have a separate tank. Like there is some things that come with this. But it's a separate heating system and it's a little bit more efficient than running it through like the heater core of your car. Uh, just food for thought, not saying it's perfect for everybody, not saying it's terrible for everybody, just another option that's out there that I kind of thought was neat. Units like that work really good in vans, yeah. even potentially minivans, back of trucks, small campers, uh, a lot of bigger items. Uh, I'm not sure I'd ever see it in a smaller vehicle, you just usually don't have the space or the need. Um, do note that most vehicles idling don't burn a ton of gas um, in idle. So, but yeah, it's it's definitely a consideration. Um, the other huge advantage we did mention power, but with that power, there's a lot of things you can get out of it. You can maintain your phones. You can get little uh, 12 volt fridges, so you can maintain that stuff. Again, remember anything you plug in is draining the battery as long as it's running. So. Uh, still having insulate, good insulation in your fridge makes a big difference, means it has to run less. Um, and again, if you have a bigger system, like a, say, a, say a full-size van, you can potentially have a propane out, uh, fridge, like the three-way fridge, 12 volt, 120 and or uh, propane. Those work really well. Some of those are pretty good. You can, you'll see those in almost every trailer. You can buy them or you can just salvage them out of an existing trailer. <laughs> um, On that note think... of dead batteries, sorry, I'm just adding in the things I had brought up where it fits convenient. Uh, something you can get, which is relatively inexpensive, is one of these little suckers. I don't know how well they work uh, personally. I don't own one. But you can get these. They slap in your 12-volt outlet and they're supposedly monitor the voltage off your battery so if you are charging running things like that you can at least keep an eye on it make sure your battery doesn't get down some newer vehicles they know that they'll shut down like the 12 volt accessories and stuff like that once it drops below certain voltages but if you don't have that kind of convenience and stuff i think one of these would be great you can get dedicated voltage meters as well that you wire in directly and run the display back a little bit more advanced depending on your comfort level of wiring but this if it works the way it's supposed to uh, seems like a pretty ineffective, or sorry, effective and cost efficient method of keeping an eye on that. Now, a really good method, if you have the space for it, is just get a second battery. And with those, you usually get like isolation relays so that one battery will never actually fully drain. That's the one that starts in your car, but the other one can run all your accessories and will charge up every time you, you run the vehicle. Uh, that's done with a series of diodes and some relays if you need to do it. Um, you know, get, there are kits you can buy to tell you exactly how to do that. Um, some full-size trucks already have a spot to mount a second battery. I know my Silverado did. Um, and other vehicles, you, you can find a place in the trunk or, 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 or a similar type place and just run the wiring to it. In, in those cases, too, you can also make it like a removable unit. So when you're not camping with it, you can just grab the whole thing and go. Uh, some people, when they do those, they'll wire in some five volt USB ports, maybe a small inverter. And you can buy pre-made units like this. Um, Eliminator does one from Canadian Tire. I've owned a few of those. Um, thing is the batteries on those are generally somewhat limited. You can go to more uh, Jackery, I think is a big one right now, but there's a few other brands. Um, they're, they're designed for this and you plug them into your car, the car keeps them charged up and some of them you can go two or three days with running a small fridge and basic appliances, right? So just before we get too far from here, it's just uh, Terrascoat Adventures. 
uh, from here. They said they have a micro one in their camper. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Terra Scout, that is the diesel heater. And if you do check out their YouTube channel, Terra Scout Adventures, just YouTube it. I think you got some installation videos there. I'm just picking my memory. Correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, if anybody's interested in something like that, I believe you can pop over to their channel and check it out. They also mentioned a Propex heater if you have propane. And I have heard that name before, and it is a little heater, much like you would find in a camper, like smaller camper and stuff like that, if I'm not mistaken once again. Something I don't specialize in myself. I did have a diesel heater in one of my trucks and caps once upon a time, but that's about the limit off my knowledge right there it was uh, and I redneck science to the heck out of that to be honest with you so um we uh search and rescue where we ran bigger trucks we actually went and got like a little heater core it ran rad fluid so you ran it back and uh it's just like a second cab here and we use that for heating the back of our vehicles. And again, it's, it has to do with the idling, but it gets more of the of the rad heat. So you're recovering a little bit more of it. Um, but Jeremy put a wood stove in two of his vehicles. Yep. And I've seen that. You can get micro stoves. Uh, we're also joined by Red Sand Adventures from PEI. Planning to build in the back of my Toyota Tacoma with a contractor cap. Going to use it for more for longer fishing trips and more fishing trips. Uh, so... Like Ben just mentioned there, a buddy of ours, uh, Lone Wolf 902 check his channel out. Uh, he may have branched off to another couple channels there. He may have one specifically for the camper uh, truck now. I can't remember. But in any case, he actually did a build with a cap. Uh, and I think it's one of the vehicles that put the wood stove in, wasn't it? Yeah, I think he put a wood stove in both the bus and his the back of his truck. And I think one of his sites is now like Destination Wilderness or Destination Adventure. Something like that. Uh, I've lost track of how many channels he's got. So yeah. find something with a familiar face. Could be his channel. He's done one, I think, with him and his girlfriend. Another one is mainly review. Uh, so he's, he's, he's sort of branching out and specializing some of his channels so people can get what they want without getting what they, they're not interested in. Uh, which, you know, I understand where he's coming from. And bus uh, heaters. Troy was just saying their bus heaters. He remembers his father getting them for people. Nice little heater. Other options there. So heat is a big one, uh, especially if you can figure out some way of being more efficient with your heat. Yeah. Um, and in the summer, the opposite's true, right? Um, heats, your, your killer vehicles have a lot of windows. It's kind of a greenhouse effect, so they can get really hot. Uh, so similar to this, the little pieces that we said we could put in, like the Reflectix, getting some screens that'll cover the windows and allow you to open them and, and still not like, yeah, perfect. <laughs> Good man. So and not all that much money. Uh, and we know that when you pull the window down with a screen over it, it's not as efficient as the no screen. Like air does slow down a little bit. And we've talked about that with hammocks and stuff in the past, but it's still way better than the windows closed. <laughs> uh, and if the mosquitoes and stuff are bad, that is, definitely an issue and there's times in the spring uh I, I know in nova scotia where if you had to leave your window open because it was too hot i think the flies would be worse oh it's <laughs> just terrible but you know what there is a little oh i got the wrong thing up here because i flipped back but anyway uh oh, there it is um there is a little hack for these to some degree you can make a set of these dirt cheap literally go into whatever big box mart walmart canadian tire whatever is your favorite home building supply center just look for door screen and go to the dollar store and pick up some magnets this yeah. is what we used to do for the drive-in and if anybody remembers what a drive-in is uh you know age showing that we still have drive-ins around here so anyway they still out there still exist but that's what we used to do for the drive-in we literally just cut like squares of screen and you would open your door, you'd get out, and you'd tack it on the A sill and around, and then you'd close it. And you could leave your window open, and the bugs wouldn't bother you. Because otherwise, if it was you and your significant other and a couple kids or whatever in the car, like the body heat alone in the summer was enough to basically make you want to run around the car and keep the air conditioner on. But once again, cost was always a factor, things like that, especially like the times I'm talking, AC really wasn't popular in vehicles at this point. Um <laughs> It just wasn't practical, but that, yeah, yeah. what are we screen from Walmart or whatever? Walmart is where I got it. I think it was like $15 for, I don't know, six meters of the stuff or something. And it did yeah. almost all four windows the last time I did this. And we, we still have a drive in here and you can still go to it. So it's been recent and the d magnets literally was just from the dollar store. 
and you can buy the screen sometimes at the dollar store they have ones that that can cover like openings to to doors and you just walk through there's a series of magnets up the middle a couple of kits of that three or four bucks a piece cover your 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 opening windows in. and the magnets are built in and the magnets are already there so hard to beat it right so uh, there are options but yeah just covering your your opening with a screen and that that'll help uh protect you for that um so yeah so those are some things like i said it's your good sleeping bag for sure there's the advantage of the power you can keep food um the last thing is sort of cooking now I, oh god I, do I, I have something for cooking for you this is not practical in any way shape or form and i just want to start with this I was like, yeah, I, I remember you can get these little kitchens for the back of your vehicle. They're not super expensive, much like what you have for the, the you know, your uh, yeah. camp kitchen. You can get kind yeah. of something like that for a vehicle. And I couldn't remember what it was. And I, I typed in some weird stuff and I came up with this god awful thing. And honestly, it's great, but highly impractical. Thousand dollars, basically your entire kitchen, including the kitchen sink. Yeah. Um, if you look up soft roading the west um he's a guy i think based in colorado or utah anyways he does a ton of it and he built his own like that and there's mm. a bunch of guys who have uh he had a a forester similar to what i'm running now and then, now he's moved to a nissan frontier i think but he built a whole system like that and like you said when you open up his back he pulled it out had a set of legs he had a full fridge stove he had everything there he had a bed set in there so you can build this stuff if if you're planning on a long trip you can convert your small suv car and bigger people have done it with full-size suvs pathfinders explorers expeditions things like that they built some amazing rigs and people are living there like that right back of trucks been done uh, over and over in so many ways people have built their own caps they bought caps and modified them uh, all these methods are very good. Uh, was it uh, Red Sand Adventures? If they look up soft roading the West, if they haven't already, I think he's running a similar style vehicle, so he might have some good ideas. He and he used the contractor's cap. Uh, so great con concepts there. So what we're getting to though is, yeah, you can definitely do it. Do you need special gear? Not really. I still think you should have some basic gear, decent sleeping bag, or, uh, still want a good cook system. Can you cook sort of with just what your vehicle has? I, I've heard people try frying eggs and stuff on engines. That's highly inefficient and dirty as hell. Uh, you can buy I a butane don't... stove for twenty nine ninety nine. I don't recommend you sit in the pa driver's seat and cook in the passenger seat. I do recommend you get out of your vehicle for this. But literally a nice butane burner, twenty nine ninety nine. I think Canadian Tire has them on right now. And you can get a three pack of butane for 12 bucks. And it's what we use during the hurricane. We got five days out of one tank of butane. Like I, I was amazed. Don't get me wrong. We weren't cooking seven course meals or anything, but I mean, we did a fair amount of cooking and heating up water and stuff. And they last a long time for their cost. They're not expensive and they pack up small. So we went out and bought a 10 pound propane tank. So we didn't have as big a one. So we got a smaller propane tank um because i don't like buying those disposable ones and i don't like the little butane ones either because you, you you're left with you know they're not refillable yep. really um and that's not a bad option either i paid a bit more for the tank than i would have for 20 uh and but it's 10 bucks to, to fill it i think now so even at the more expensive places it's not that bad um and that'll last you quite a while and i went out and bought myself a decent small compact barbecue from costco but Canadian Tire, Walmart, they all sell similar ones. This one maybe, I like it's a bit better quality than what I'm used to, but it doesn't fold as well as some of the other ones. So if you're looking for safe, space savings, look around. Um, I looked at the Coleman one, the really flat one, opens up like a griddle. There's a ton of these things you can get. Stick in the back of your vehicle and have it be able to cook quite a bit. So with these are things you can't do, uh, you know, hiking, camping. You can go with a slightly bigger thing. If I was to invest on something, that might be the thing I invest for with my car camping is a, is a better cooking set, set up because you have the room and, uh, you know. So while we're talking about room, that was another point I wanted to bring up was yeah. you can expand your room 
pretty easy with a vehicle as well. There's different options there. Uh, you've seen one that kind of popped up here really quick and I was going to chat about it. It's basically just an awning or a sunshade for the back of your vehicle. It gives you some rain cover. You can literally, uh, I, I don't know if Ben has put pictures up in the past, but he has a camp kitchen. It's just a Coleman camp kitchen, gives you a little counter space, some stuff like that. You can literally slip one of those in your vehicle with one of these. You can set your kitchen up outside your vehicle. And that expands your space even more. Now your vehicle has become your shelter, and that is the beauty of a vehicle. It's a ready-made shelter. You pull up. It's already windproof, waterproof, probably yeah. better than most tents and hammock setups. You know what I mean? And there you go. Uh, if you don't like one that attaches to your vehicle, which, you know, I, I'm kind of... I tip top back and forth. I like the idea of being able to unplug and drive away. If something went wrong, and this is one of Ben's points from different episodes, is... What if somebody gets hurt? You're into like 10, 20 minutes trying to disassemble your vehicle from your kit to leave. And that's yeah. always kind of one of those things in the back of my head too. So even like uh, one of those pop-up tents, gazebos, whatever they're called, you can get them for like $69, $79, depending when they go on sale from, once again, any of your big box marts. I see them all the time at Walmart for around $79, $89. And just... Slide in your vehicle. When you get to where you're going, you can pull it out. If it's raining or something you don't want to set up, you can slide it under your vehicle. Or if you have the time, you set it up just beside your vehicle, stake it down so it doesn't blow into your vehicle, and bam. Once again, yeah. you got more room. There's there's lots of awning kits you can get. There are tents that att attach to the back of SUVs, vans, and trucks. There is a, a tent that sits right in the back of a truck. Uh, and the first one that came out of that that I, I really knew about was the Pontiac Aztec. When they sold that originally, one of the options was a tent that came with it and hooked right to the back and they like doubled the space. Uh, I don't know if you have a picture of that there. But. No, I don't have that one. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> I had a lot, but that wasn't one of them. Uh, that's that's the, the best one, buddy. The best one. I never owned an Aztec, but I've seen one of the log owners. There's still some running. <laughs> that's amazing. Um but yeah, no. So those those ideas do exist, and and the problem you said, like you can't necessarily drive away. Some of those can disconnect quickly, and you can reattach when you come back. So, uh, just be good at backing up. If you back up too much, you're going to damage it. Not enough, you won't reach. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. I mean, you do got to hone those skills. Driving is another skill, and if you're going to be using it for adventuring, it's something you got to hone and practice. Yeah. But yeah, that, that like I said, the biggest advantage to a vehicle is ready-made shelter so take advantage of that i i have zero problems with people that like to do car camping or truck camping or whatever like it's a great idea i just don't have the ability to do it to the level that i want because i'm a little glamorous and i like my nicety so i'd want all these things otherwise i'm going to take my normal toys and go sleep in the dirt but uh it's it's a great way to get out there even for people uh, that aren't planning long adventures. If you just have a one-nighter, it's real easy to drive out in your vehicle, make up your campfire and stuff, enjoy the outdoors, and then just jump in your vehicle for the sleep. There's none of that setting up a tent. Like, you can basically get this thing ready in your driveway. Drive yeah. to where you need to be, and you're set up. You park the vehicle, you open the back. If it's on a lake or something, you can have a few of the adult beverages or whatever your choice may be. Watch the water, enjoy your fire. Once it burns out, you just close your vehicle up, you go to sleep, you wake up in the morning... You're basically like if it was a bad night, you know what I mean? You just you just stay in bed a little longer. You don't have to worry about getting up and breaking everything down or doing whatever, right? I'm not recommending anything to do with alcohol and a vehicle. <laughs> no. Uh, but no, you can. You can cover a lot of distance this way, too. If you need to go, say, across Canada, there's probably not many better ways. You're trying to save a few bucks. You don't want to spend $150 a night on motels and hotels. Then, you know, invest four or $500 in the beginning, but then you can travel. And if you want to take a few extra days, you kind of have it. And then it's a system that you own and you can use again. So when you get where you're going or when you get back, you can take a lot of that stuff out, just pack it away at your home. And then if you want to do another trip, you can. So after the first trip, it kind of pays for itself, right? Uh, but like I said, some of these systems can get very elaborate, uh, but a lot of it's still modular and usable in other situations. Uh, Hurricane Fiona is a great example of that. Had you had things like a Jackery power supply, you know, it's one of these, you know, so small solar systems that you can plug in to help charge things up. You know, these things would get you a little bit further. You can use them in a lot of situations. Um, 
So there's kind of an advantage there. Um, you say good sleeping system. Uh, it is limited. You can only really do it with two or three people in a vehicle. And, and that start... was one of the big drawbacks I had listed was it's not a family camping. <laughs> yeah. Even like a camper van, you're kind of limited in the number of people you're going to get in it. The, the truck bed campers had the same issue, right? They were generally two people rigs. Um, there was exceptions, but. <laughs> big money for what you're getting. Yeah. They're specialty uh, niches. Yeah, uh, definitely doable. Definitely something you, you, you can do. Do be careful of the, of the monoxide potential. Uh, but if you know what you're doing and you set it up right, you can definitely minimize that li likelihood. And we highly recommend the monoxide sensor and the CO2 sensors or whatever, right? So once again, funny little story. Somebody sent me a picture and I'm sure it was a meme or something, but it was two trucks pulled back to back with a big tarp over it. And the caption was, it's such a great setup. If you're cold, you just run the engines. And all I could think of was, this has to be a joke. <laughs> so don't be that person, please. Don't be a statistic. Don't be a meme. Uh, but yeah, use common sense. Um, I, I, I guess, you know, we've covered a lot of what I wanted to cover. There's a lot more you could always talk about. We could get into great detail. But I've seen people doing this stuff like... I pulled into one spot and a family got it. A family of three got out. They had a, a silver auto or a full size pickup. I don't, I don't remember the brand. It doesn't matter. And he just took a tarp and literally threw over the bed and he just had a couple of rocks on the corners to keep it from falling. And he pulled the tailgate up and him and his wife and his son, I think, slept in the bed of that truck with just the tarp over the top. And I'm like, if it rained, it would have all sat on top of them. <laughs> you know what? Melissa's parents, when they came down for our wedding, or maybe it was the rehearsal, or something around the wedding anyway, they had a little uh, Suzuki Isuzu or something like that. I can't remember. Anyway, it's a little quarter-ton truck. That's exactly what they did. They had an air mattress, threw it in the bed. They had a tarp. Uh, I think originally they had set up some poles with PVC pipe. Uh, just to sit in the, the, the box corners or box pockets, whatever you want to call it, just enough to kind of put, you know, a pitch to it. So if it did rain, water would shed and yeah. that's all they slept in. And then I think the PVC pipe broke at one point and then it was just a tarp over a truck. Uh, but they at least stretched it over the cab. So water would hopefully run down. I remember them getting a little bit wet anyway, long story short, it can be done. Yeah. Uh, just work out your imperfections before putting it in practical use. And, I mean, you can always take a small tent and set up next to it. Um, but there's definitely, you know, advantages. I mean, a lot of people have told me, like, if it does rain and flooding, you're in a vehicle, you're already, you know, six, seven inches off the ground before you even have to worry about anything getting to potentially your vehicle. More if you have, like, a full-size truck or, or a bigger SUV and stuff. Uh, less if you're driving, you know, a vehicle, especially if it's been lowered. Uh Again, I'm picking on you Civic people. <laughs> Nothing against Civics, it's just... No, I have something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, I mean, my truck, you're 100% right. I think I got 10 inches of clearance now with the new tires and stuff. Or yeah. close to, it's probably not that. But anyway, like, I got a little ways to go before the, I got to worry about the lake again. Yeah, I think I'm running it just over nine in, in, in my Forester with the oversized tires. So, yeah, I mean, you, you have a bit of space there before you have to really worry less critters are going to get in in with you you don't have to worry about snakes or squirrels or stuff getting in is, is it possible they can get in and damage your vehicle yes you know some of these have come in and chewed on wiring and stuff but you're still you know safer even bears and moose are less likely to be an issue not that they normally are raccoons things like that they're not going to get into your vehicle as much and if you've if you really get panicked if something really scares you there's nothing stopping you from turning the key and just driving away yep <laughs> And that's where vehicle camping comes in great as that stepping stone into camping. Uh, I know with young kids and stuff like that, it's always easier to say, hey, yeah, we'll just sleep in the car. It gives a sense of security because you do yeah. have, it's a little bit of sound dampening from outside. You don't have to worry about the spooky noises. You know what I mean? Like you don't hear the gurgling water and things and stuff. You'll hear big noises, but you don't generally pay attention to them as much because you do have that feeling of security with solid walls versus 
fabric walls. So for kids or people that are not maybe not as keen in going into the woods and sleeping on the ground because they're scared of the creatures or whatever the case may be, it's a great way to get them out there and realize that, hey, yeah, in the middle of the night, we didn't get rampaged by, you know, rabid squirrels. It's it's fine. Rabbits are horrible, too. No. <laughs> uh, lightning is another thing. Like, you're, you're kind of naturally protected. You have four rubber tires underneath you, you know. So it's... You know, there's there's some things in there, right? Uh, so, what are the advantages? Obviously, time and distance. You can go a lot further. You don't, you know, clean up can be pretty quick, especially if it's the right setup. You can carry more gear, so you don't need to buy the more expensive lightweight gear. You can buy some of the bulkier, more expensive gear and really enjoy the advantage those give you, right? Um, so yeah, you're not worried about weight. You're worried much less with volume. Most vehicles are expandable, and by that I mean you can put a hitch in it and have an, you know, uh, a carrier put out the back, or you can put racks on the roof and carry stuff up there. Uh, so you can expand your space, not only just inside, but like outside. So you can carry more gear that way. We didn't really get into that, but it's definitely an advantage of it, right? Oh, for sure. But we're trying to keep it into the cheap realm, I think is what the question actually was. So they didn't want well, to buy we... more gear. I'm foolish people. I mean, you always want to buy more gear. But again, Kijiji, uh, Facebook Marketplace, these uh, even Value Village. I've been in there and seen a lot of these these items in there before. You can buy like you know racks and stuff at these places. Princess Auto usually has sales on it. I picked up my truck hitch, and I think it's an aluminum one for ninety nine dollars one year. Uh, so again, sub one hundred dollars basically allows me to carry twice as much stuff as I could have in my trunk without it. Ask your buddies if they know anyone. That's how I got a boat rack. I had a buddy that, uh, which way are we going? There we go. That knew about a, tr a boat rack. And I got one. And realistically, if I threw a tarp over that, like a big tarp, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Pretty good shelter. Run a couple boards uh, across the top tar in case it rains. <laughs> and uh, run the tarp down the sides. And I mean, that'd be a great shelter. You mean, you know, honestly, a couple of pieces of, of wood, it wouldn't even have to be two by four, maybe two by twos even or, or, yep. or less. And, you know, a sewing machine and you can make a, a, a cloth cap for that truck very easily. Right? Yeah, so you, some good canvas. So make, yeah. And I am kind of thinking of making a big iron skin. And we've talked about this in previous episodes uh, yeah. or iron fiber, whatever you want to call it, where it's basically like uh, mineral spirits and uh, boiled linseed oil and dry it out really good. Nice big one. And then customize to the truck and literally do what you just said. A couple yeah. four by fours in the end to keep it from ripping and to, you know, make it shed water and then just, boop, you just yeah. keep it in the back of the truck, flip it over. But, uh, yeah. So, I mean, with very minor changes and, and, and basic kit that you may already have home, you may already have a small compact bar barbecue, especially if you're, you're already living in, say, small apartments and stuff. Um, if you're in a, you know, if you have a full size barbecue, it's not like you like be dragging that with you. Um, small Coleman camp stoves, things like that, you know, do very well with car camping. Uh, you talked about my folding kitchen. So all these things kind of allow you to expand when you get out there, but they fold up quickly and get put away and they're compact. Uh, a couple of things I advise people to do if you're using the inside of your vehicle, your sleeping space, and you're taking gear, have waterproof. Uh, containers to put everything in and you can just push those inside your vehicle keep your gear like you can have all your cook gear in one and all your sleeping gear in another and you can just sort of label it they would if you do it right you can slide it in it'll fit really well and when you get to the spot you just pop it right out and then boom your space is ready and then when you're ready to go home come back and just grab the whole bin and slide it in it means that your setup and tear down time can be minimized and that is kind of the key to vehicle camping because you do have a tendency to bring more stuff because you have the availability. Organization. As Ben said, keep it in totes. Label it with a big permanent marker. <laughs> yeah, my wife has the cricket. And I I just have her like, you know, this is camp, you know, sleep bags. And she'll make up a sleep bag depot and I'll stick on it. And then I know like that container is always sleep bags and I grab that. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, it's it's a good thing. Take take your care and stuff. Uh, again, because you're not worried about size and bulk, go to the go to Value Village, go to the thrift stores. You can get decent sleeping bags. You know they're not 
they're not necessarily going to be your your goose down 800 fill power ultra small ultra fit in your yeah. <laughs> but you know sometimes you pick up the old military ones or even like the big coleman like um comfy one that, that sort of like what you got there like that oh the titan yeah the, the titan you know sleeps a family of eight in minus 700 degrees <laughs> Family of four, 350 maximum. <laughs> Minus 273. Absolute zero inside. It's perfectly fine inside. You're good. You just pull it up, snuggle a little bit more. Yeah. Right. But no, realistically, you can get all that stuff from turf shops, value yeah. villages. So uh, if, you, if you're trying to do this, you don't have the time and, and money to, to really get into true backwoods camping and, and you're just looking for the gateway drug. Uh, and that's what I think car camping would be. You know, you can get to really cool places. You can see great sunsets. You can camp near the beach and stuff. It really is cool. And then the bug will come and you'll want to go further. But then you can start swamping gear out for slightly lighter, slightly more compact gear. And then it's, and start doing it, right? Maybe your first trips are only a few hundred meters from your vehicle. But that's the start. Next thing you know, you're, you're 12 kilometers back. I'm wondering how in the hell you got back here. Where the hell are you <laughs> taking me, Ben, please? <laughs> uh people people who camp with me like that i always regret it <laughs> or can never get enough it's one of the two it is. <laughs> but it's still getting out there and having fun so it's still yeah. very reliable we don't look down on anybody that does any of this we highly recommend it if it's your only mode of getting out there we know a lot of people with uh mobility issues and stuff like that this is how they camp and they say oh you know it's not real camping it is camping if you're getting out there you're having fun and doing what you like get at it yeah some of these old fire roads and stuff, you can get back in some pretty cool spots and set up and be like comfortable. You know, like I said, you set up your little mobile kitchen, set up a couple of tarps, maybe set up a, a kitchen tent or something to have everything in. And you stay there for two or three days and be as comfortable as you want. And, you, and if you want to walk and explore and then come back, you can and you don't have to worry about dragging a ton of gear. And so if you have knee problems, back problems, shoulder problems or any problem where you don't want to carry a backpack still want to explore you can do day trips um and you can take extra gear with you if you want to take a small uh, you know you can take say a sup or a, or a kayak or a, or a canoe you know i hope you don't get into that because it's it's an addictive like, uh you yeah. just keep spending money <laughs> how many boats do you need as many as you're allowed to buy n oh, plus one where n is the number you presently have <laughs> Actually, Terror Scout here had a, a real good piece of advice, life hack, whatever you want to call it when you're camping in yeah. your car. I never thought of this. A few blocks of two by six, super handy to leverage your vehicle in uneven spots. Never thought of that. Easy to carry. And if there's a problem, you just back up, put one where the low spot is under your tire. You drive on it. You'll eventually get it leveled out. Brilliant idea, because that's kind of what I needed when I ended up in the car. I was kind of, you know, sunk to one corner, and but... It, it worked, but, man, a couple pieces of 2 by 6 would have made it so much better and easy. I used to do that with my trailer. Because although you, with, with my pop-up trailer, you could, you know, the, the little jacks could give you some ability. It was much better if it was already pretty level. And so we, we did exactly that. A couple of 2 by 6s I think we had a handful, and we put it in. And I also stuck one under any jack point because it just didn't sink in as much, right? Uh, so those are great methods. Um, to use. There are leveling kits you can buy, but the 2 by 6 is way cheaper and works. Uh, well, with cost of wood now, who knows? But. Oh, man. The, the, the leveling kits I looked at kind of looked like Lego. Like, they snapped together, and but I think it was 120 300 bucks. Ugh, like okay. You could pay for these kits, and you can still get a piece of 2 by 6 for under 30 bucks. Oh, for sure. Right? But. So... Grab your two by six, cut it up into a bunch of chunks. And snow. you can burn them if you get real hard up. Good point. <laughs> uh, again, uh, just the gear you can take bigger saws, bigger axes. You can take a chainsaw if you want. You don't have to worry about it. So that stuff comes easy. I recommend like an electric one. You can charge up when you're back there and you don't have that extra fuel to be lagging around. But all these things. Uh, my vehicle is kind of set up that I could do it. I still think I would sleep in my hammock, but I do use the vehicle to get back further, right? And sometimes you don't want to, you don't want to hike or you just don't have the time. You get off work, especially this time of year, it's dark by the time you get home.
But if you, you can go out with your vehicle, you can always be in sight. And when you get up in the morning, you're already in the woods. And that savings is... Or you have what we have right here. It's mm -hmm. just suddenly, in the last 24 hours, they put out a weather warning that we're getting 70 mils of rain tonight. If your plan was to go out tonight, that's pretty hard to set a tent up. But not impossible. Not saying you can't yeah. do it. Just saying how easy would it be to drive up and be like... Well, and tomorrow morning is supposed to be beautiful. Like tomorrow is an absolute beautiful day. It's just one of these freak storms that blew in on the East Coast. But uh, yeah, how easy would it be just to pull up, be like, oh, I'll crawl on the back and go to sleep tonight. And then when you wake up, then you can start, you know, your actual outdoors adventure or whatever the case may be. Yeah, 100%. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's 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 sort of the idea. That's sort of the thought process there. Um, you know, it's definitely a mode of operation to get out there. Yeah. Um, Maybe in the future we'll, we'll we'll do some little video showing our setups that we have used, um, but no promises. Uh, and I guess that depends on you folks out there. What do you guys think? We always love to hear from you. We haven't done this in the uh, last couple episodes. Reach out to us, AtlanticBushcraft.ca. There's a contact us link. Jump on Facebook, type in Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures, YouTube Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Jump on Google or your favorite search engine and throw in Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. You are going to find us somewhere. It's hard not to. <laughs> some camping videos. Maybe in the future we'll have some camping videos. Do you want to know what, Chris? This is what we've found. Ben and I have come to the conclusion. We always mean to make videos. We go out, we do our thing, and it's always the camera's an afterthought. Making camping videos is an art. It really is. You have to go out with that mindset. And unfortunately, and I hate to say this because this is kind of what our thing is with this podcast... It falls to the back burner. We get out there, we get excited, we get our stuff set up, we get our fires ready, we play with any new equipment we get, and then we went, oh crap, we should have recorded all that. <laughs> then we spend the rest of the night talking about how we should have recorded it. And it's happened almost consistently every time we've gone out. Yeah, no, for sure, 100%. All right, great in theory, just not practical for us. I am going to try to do more, uh, but there's there's definitely, like, the effort to do it is... is and I do find it takes away from the trip a bit when you do. I agree. I am supposed to be going out the weekend of the 5th and 6th uh, with one of our friends here from Nova Scotia, Steve. Hopefully I'm going to get a little bit of video shot at that point. I don't own a GoPro, Chris. I have a cell phone, bud. I never could afford a GoPro. I agree. If I had a GoPro, I would strap it to my chest or head or whatever and off I'd go. Problem is, anytime we need to make a video, this is how we have to do it. Because we're I poor. Have, <laughs> I do have GoPro knockoffs. I have like a set of them, like five or six, and like a dozen batteries. But like even that, setting them up, the audio issues, of like hooking up external mics, especially if they're in the waterproof cases and stuff, it's it all adds to it. And then you get to do sound over. The editing, when, the ones we have done uh, in the past have been an editing nightmare for me and Robert, to, to one point where I actually did some and sent to Robert and said, can you just finish it? Because I can't. And uh, it's, it's. I think, you know, we, we struggle with it. So um, We're bushcrafters, not IT people. We are getting better. We are learning. And unfortunately for you folks out there, you, do, you don't really get to see that behind the scenes. Um, we are technical okay guys. We are not video savvy guys. And that was kind of our downfall going into this because it was all we ever supposed to be, really, the podcast. And uh, then we kind of was like, well, let's make some videos because that's fun too. And we need to learn how. <laughs> but we are working on it. It is getting better. Actually, RM Shoots has a great idea here. We just have to try and think out how to make it. What do you think of a camping alone together video? Stream with each other during the trip. You get two different trips, like two different experiences. I guess the thing would be to figure out a time that works because there's a four hour time difference between Ben and I now, but I would actually be kind of good. The other thing that might be tricky on that instance is generally where we go is poor cell phone reception. So we'd have to find somewhere where we know there's good, strong cell phone connection. And, and somewhat limited data. Yeah. Somewhat. So, but we could definitely do short calls and short comparisons and stuff for sure. We'd almost have to have a third person sitting at a computer to stream it all through. We can figure this out. I have confidence. Will it be the highest quality like Hollywood? Absolutely not. Will it be funny as heck to watch? Guaranteed. Yeah. Anyways, buddy, uh, I think we've come up to our hour and I have a few things I have to, to And do. it's getting late in this here, so i got to get to bed too. Anyways, great times. Like I said, get out there, have fun. If you do anything, share it with us. We'd love to hear about it.
Night, everybody. See you next week.